Um, next, we move to general session legislation preparation. For that, we'll have, uh, yes, already on their way. Good afternoon. Angie Stallings, Deputy Superintendent of Policy, and Greg Cannell is here with us as well. Uh, we're going to just share with you five uh, proposed requests for statutory change that um, staff have identified. Um, a couple of these were on the agenda in June, but we didn't get to them, so that's why we have a little longer list this month than normal. So I'll go through the five, and then Madam Vice Chair, if, you, if you'd like, I can go through the five and then take questions, or um, we can take questions as we go. So you just let me know when you'd like me to stop. Um, the first request for statutory change would be to amend 53E to 304. And if you look in um, subsection 2B3C, which is quite a, a long subsection, there's been confusion by LEAs by the language in there that makes it look like there are two plans that are required. Um, and it, it mentions an individual learning plan and a plan for college and career readiness when really the individual learning plan is a subset or is encompassed in the plan for college and career readiness. So staff are just asking for that individual learning plan portion to be eliminated in order to reduce confusion. So that's the first one. The second one is a, a request or recommendation to amend section 53 F4203. Um, and this is related to recent changes, I guess it's been a little over a year ago, that the legislature changed the early interactive reading software program. Instead of it being managed by the state, um, the funding now goes out to LEAs, individual LEAs, and because of that, there are a lot more providers. Annually, there's an evaluation that is required by an outside provider, uh, an external evaluator. Because there are so many new providers, there um, has been a request for additional funds. So you're gonna be, you might be saying, well, don't we need to talk about this in the funding request? Actually, the code allows the board currently to use up to 4% to pay for the external evaluator and uh, other administrative costs. And what we're recommending is that 4% me move to 6%. So all it would do is give the board some authority to use additional funds from that existing appropriation to um, contract with the external evaluator to do the evaluation of the efficacy of those providers. So that's what number two is. Number three would be to amend uh, section 53 G7 to 18. Um, this is the section of code related to the early literacy plan. Because the legislature eliminated the, what used, what used to be called K through three reading program or early literacy program, there's no longer funding or dedicated restricted funding for early learning related to literacy. And so the staff are recommending that there be changes to 218 to, um, be in line with the changes that the legislature made by eliminating the early learning uh, appropriation, including um, having more of a focus on math, uh, removing the requirement that a local board or charter school governing board approve the plan because no longer are they tied to uh, funding, so it will reduce reporting burdens, et cetera. So that's what number three is. Number four is a, t a recommendation to amend 53 G10403. This is the section of code that lists the topics um, regarding sex education instruction where parental consent is required. There has been some um, confusion about the list there and the idea would be to just review the list, update it, and um, ensure that, for example, I'll give just an example that um, there's, a li there's a listing for HIV AIDS, but that's a subset of sex sexually transmitted diseases. So there's this, I, there's this uh, intent and request from the field for more clarity on some of those terms in order to ensure that educators are clear when they need parental consent. So that would be number four, and you can look in the backup documents for more examples. And then the last one is to amend section 53 F2, 504, and 
When you look at this section in the code, there are two versions of 504. There's a version that is in effect until July 1, 2025, and it is currently called the Teacher Salary Supplement Program, TSSP. Beginning 2526, that program is being renamed the SHINE program or the Salary Supplement for Highly Needed Educators. When the legislature renamed and rebranded the TSSP to SHINE, they inadvertently uh, forgot to include USDB. So currently, USDB educators qualify for the TSSP, but when they rewrote um, this program, um, they just stated school districts and charter schools where the old just said educators in general. And so uh, the staff recommend that we update 53F2504. And again, there's no impact this year. USDB educators will continue to be eligible for the stipend for this 24-25 school year. It's just proactively making sure that they will also be eligible for the rebranded program beginning 2526. So that's what number five would be, is to ensure that USDB um, can be included. And we did check uh, with the legislature, and it was not their intent to exclude USDB. It was just a kind of a, instead of using LEA, they changed to district and charter. And anyway, it, it changed a bit. And that's it. Chair Moss. Quick question on three. Um, how much is going out? How much is going to that evaluator? And um, are they balking at the cost currently? Uh, two, sorry. So that is a good question. Well, money we allocate to the evaluator pay, correct? Okay. There's an external evaluator that's been doing this for a while. It's gone back and forth. But I'm just curious if they're sort of telling us we don't. And who's our current evaluator? I apologize, that's so is two Amber or three questions. Right here. Uh, Amber Wright is online, and it oh, looks like she's prepared great. to uh, enter the discussion. Thank you. Amber, Hi, go Amber ahead. Wright, Digital Instructional Material Specialist for USBE. So our current evaluator is the Educational Technology Institute, or ETI. And they have a, had a contract for 150,000 um, when we had our state contracts, which was five provider SP. Um, just to give you an idea with the changes in legislation, our providers went from five providers when we have state contracts to 20 providers this year. And so when they're doing that evaluation, um, they were estimating what that, what that existing cost would be. And then this year, um, they have been working on figuring out what the evaluation looks like with those 20 providers instead of five providers. Um, and that involves them getting all of the usage information from every single uh, provider for software and then doing that evaluation. So they um, estimated the ship for those additional 15 providers it would require an additional $70,000, and we were able to find those funds um, from a different um, being source, but um, we're hoping to not have to do that in the future, so. Got it, thank you. And is ETI the one that's been doing it for a while? I mean, like 15, 20 years? Yes, ETI has been doing it since the beginning of the program, so. Yeah, thank you. Member Lear? Um, I have a a little different question related to parentheses two also. Um, there, it, I, I misunderstood to begin with. There's one independent evaluator, so the appropriation would just provide that independent evaluator with more resources because there are more, um, because there are now more providers for the um, software. So if I may move forward. Um, the current appropriation, the 4%, is used for more than just the evaluator. It's also a, available to support administrative costs here at USBE, which I could include staff, for example. But my understanding is the reason that we are seeking the 4% to the 6% change is to um, increase the funding to the independent evaluator because so there are so many more um, interactive reading 
individual providers that need to be evaluated. So code requires annually all of those providers be evaluated by an external provider. Okay, and a follow up to that please. So I, I, I'm in favor of that. I wanted there to be enough money. But what do we see happening if the it, independent evaluator s gives low marks to somebody? If nothing happens, then I'm not going to give them any more money for, I, I don't, I would not vote to give them more money for, to do it more with no, with no consequences. So uh, have there been examples of, of when the independent evaluator gave low marks and the person and the, and the program went away or something like that that says this is an effective use of our money? Well, so let me speak to this first and then I'll open, allow Amber to use, you okay. know, to clarify with her expertise. So previously, before the funding was, um, it, previously it was administered at our level. And oftentimes we were asked to give a report on what the external evaluator said and um, at one point there was some potential for contracts to be ended with certain providers based on, as to your point, uh -huh. maybe some were lower, had lower efficacy than others. Right. Now that it's at the LEA level, I would guess okay. that that um, evaluation would be used by individual LEAs to say, ooh, this LEA, look, they're using this provider, look at the marks this provider got versus another. So it would probably be more of a useful tool now for the LEAs to look at that evaluation and then as they determine an turn to their individual contracts, they'll be more informed on how the one, you know, each of the 20 are doing or how they've been evaluated. Okay. One more follow-up, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and I can't remember where we are in that process of switching from our office to LEA oversight, but um, similarly, unless I see evidence that the LEAs are using, the, are using that information productively, and making decisions based on it, and especially it makes me concerned that we've had the same independent evaluator for 10 to 15 years, then t until, I, until and unless I see information that says LEAs are, are using this, I don't want to increase the funding. So I'm trying to say, is there, it, can we get that? I don't want to make a lot of work for anybody, and, but, I, but I also, if we're being asked to increase the funding, I want to see some ROI. <laughs> If I may, a favorite if phrase. What, what I think I'm hearing from you is maybe you w are entertaining or interested in entertaining a motion to repeal the external evaluation. Like you, does that make sense? Because I think what you're saying yeah. is you're not sure the external evaluation is well, No, I just tool. don't know either way. That's my concern. Yeah. Is it could be, I think every program that we have should be monitored and evaluated, period. And so I don't have a problem with this, but I do have a problem with it. If they're asking for more money, it's in statute, but LEAs are not using it to make uh, informed decisions. Yeah. I, I, and I don't know if somebody could speak to this, but I, I guess the issue right now is we're required to hire an external evaluator. Their, their workload has gone from evaluating five providers to 20 providers. Mm -hmm. So um, our staff have identified and think their staff have determined that they think it's a value add to recommend that the external evaluator receive additional compensation to, to fulfill that legal requirement. But I think what I'm hearing from you is potentially wanting feedback from LEAs on if they're using that or not. Yes, exactly. But, and then I would think that the policy recommendation change might be to just eliminate the evaluation. But I, can, I don't know, all I can tell you is that the staff identified this approach okay. based on the increase from five providers to 20. Would it be hard to get feedback? That might be a better question for Amber. Could I ask Amber, somebody? Amber? Yeah. I, I think you followed that rather convoluted conversation. How hard would it get, would it be to to receive feedback from LEAs about how they've used the independent um, evaluator feedback. So right now that evaluation is posted on the USBE website and we also, um, I send it out to LEAs to let them know when we have that evaluation done. Um, the evaluation takes student usage data and compares it with the, um, the state literacy scores 
to, and that's kind of how that evaluation is done. So I know that we do have LEAs that are looking at it. Um, I would have to think about how we could track that. Like I said, a lot of them are looking at it because it's on the USBE website. And I know that a lot of LEAs have reached out to me and asked for that report if they haven't been able to find it on the website. But I do think it's something that LEAs are looking at and know that that report was this. Um, but we could figure out a way to track it. It's That's not being necessarily tracked right now. I just know that they're asking about it and using that report. So. Which is sort of helpful, so thank you. All right, are we going to, um, we have no other lights. Uh, is there, are there any motions? Well. I, you I'll, don't have can, to, but you are. I see no other lights. Yeah, that is correct. It, right, that is I, not I a light. I spoke to number two and got my questions answered, so I'd be happy to move that one. I guess the language would be uh, that the board directs staff to work with legislature. Wait. Well, I guess we could entertain a motion for all five and see if folks want to separate. I will do that. I move that the board direct staff to work with legislator, later, legislators on potential amendments to the Utah Code as proposed numbers one through five. I'm sorry, Chair. What did you... I didn't hear a word you said. I just changed your salary. Oh, did you? Okay, from zero to <laughs> minus zero. <laughs> I'll be by to collect later. Okay, which ones did you move I, I forward? moved all five. I moved that we approve oh, oh, proposing no. all five to the legislature. Okay. Uh, you we'll have, see if that there's a second. Okay. <coughs> uh, I got a lot to say about that, but I will defer to uh, Member Lear. I, I, yeah, move to divide, please. But will you please hit your button again? Um, it seems to be on. Okay, thank you. I move that we divide that motion, at least taking number two out of the mix. Okay, the motion's been made to remove, uh, to divide out number two. Do we have a second on that? Second from member straight. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? I. As I said in a conversation, probably most of you checked out of. I don't want to increase this amount till I know if if it's being if the independent evaluator is being uh, taken seriously by LEAs. And okay. I also don't want to make a lot of work for LEAs, but they're asking us to increase the the amount. So I can't, in good conscience, do that until I know that the information is being used effectively. Okay, Member Bogus. Thank you, ma'am. Just for clarity, these come back for final approval, yes? Uh, will you speak to that member, or uh, Deputy Stallings? Yes, so what when you make this motion, there's those five proposed policy requests. The next step would be for staff, um, one of two things. Um, like last year, we might present the full list to the Education Interim Committee, and then the Education Interim Committee might, you know, uh, decide to do a draft committee bill with four out of six of the policy requests. That's one approach. And if that were the case and the draft bill were to come out, we would bring it to your attention. Another more co often more common approach is that we work with individual legislators, ask them to open bill files, and then they draft a bill. They will generally send us the draft bill. And of course, once the bill, sometimes we can get the draft bill to you to look at before it's numbered. Other times it won't be until it's numbered, but we could bring it to your attention if there were things you didn't like about the proposed amendments. The board could make a motion and request amendments, et cetera. I don't know if that's helpful. So the next step is to work with legislators on bill files. Okay, then can you put the list of five back up, please? I have, unless you're, if, if it's for me, I don't need it. Oh, you don't, I um, do. But I would move to amend Member Lear's motion. And um, go for it. And cordon off number four as well. Okay, so the, uh, the amendment would be to add number four to, um, just to divide, uh, out. divide out number four as well as number two. 
Do we have a second on that? Is there no objection? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So once you type that, if you'll go back to the list so I can see the three remaining. So two and four have been pulled. Uh, what? Well, it's a motion right now. Yeah. No, it's not. Um, okay. So that the motion to divide is to divide out two and four. Uh, did someone else have a an additional amendment to that? Are you? Oh, okay. Go ahead. It, once we vote for this, will that end the agenda item? Like, if I have something else I want us to consider, do I? Right. Uh, but I don't want to slow this one down. Can I wait till after yeah. and still yeah. have time? So after we finish these five, then we would open it up for any other motions. So we've got two and four out. Um, you ready for a vote on that? Okay. Wait, you don't want to vote on two and four? I want to have further light knowledge. You want to, you want further what? I want further information. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. She, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's the banning police? <laughs> um, um, I want more, a little more information on two. I, I, I don't necessarily want to disrespect SAF's opinion, but I would like to get more information uh, in the next month or two to, to so, be informed to make this vote. And and quite frankly, I have my own concerns about about number two. I don't like kindergarten through second grade students on the computer at all. So I'd like to look at um, more into the underlying law or rule and find out more information as well. So I share that concern. Is it possible that we bring that one back next month with additional information? That's would be that would be my that would be a helpful. That's where motion. I was thinking it was going to go. And just a reminder, this motion right now is just to pull two and four. So if right. you do that, right. then we'll vote on the other three, oh, and then we'll and then to divide. Separately. Yes, and then we'll consider them Good two and four um, separately. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and Chair Go Moss ahead. was reminding me of that as well. Just wanted to get that in there. All right, the motion to divide is before us. Uh, Member Bogus, do you have a question on this motion? Okay, let's, let's vote and then we'll go back to you. The motion is to divide. Um, the, uh, the motion to divide is that the board approve items two and four separately. Member Carey? Yes. Member Carey is a yes. We need two more, please check your screens. One more. Uh, there we go. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, now we go to the underlying motion, which is the board directs staff to work with legislators on potential amendments to the Utah Code as proposed, with the exception of items two and four. Would you like to speak to that motion? Okay, we've got a. Uh, that's in order. I would move that we direct staff to bring back more information on two and four. Okay, so this, so you, we're voting on the other three, and then we'll address two and four. Oh, so it had the other one, high, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, we could, I mean, theoretically, we could do it either way, but. I was just looking at the highlighted portion. Gotcha. I, I apologize. No worries. Um, so, do you have that ready? All right, please vote. Member Carey, the, are, are you prepared to vote, or you want me to restate it? Uh, no, I'm a yes. Okay. <laughs> He's a yes. Two more, please. Check your screens. One more. And that passes unanimously. Uh, yes, that passes unanimously. Now we will address the remaining items or not. Uh, go ahead and and now... Um, there is not a motion on two, so it would be just making a motion. Just, then I would move that the board direct staff to bring back more detailed information on two and four okay. to allow is the board to make a decision at that time. Is there a second for that? Second, second from Member Lear. 
Uh, uh, any speaking to that? Would you like to speak to your motion? I think people would like information. People would like information. Otherwise, I'm happy to just move this and let it come back. I think we're good. Did you have a comment? I want to make sure. I want to make sure that staff understands at least what my concerns were about yeah. too. Is yeah. that was I was I sufficiently okay? Informative. Thank okay. you very much. Can I speak? And I don't remember. Thank you. Can you ask what are you? I go ahead. Yeah, I I want details on specifically what our staff are rec recommending for four, specifically. Yes. So. What she said. I Very good. My mic is on. <laughs> I concur with I concur. Vice Chair Earl. <laughs> Very good. Are you ready to? Okay. The vote is is up. Carrie, Member Carey? Yes. yes, thank you. And my mic is still on, not that I care, but we're just giving them extra. All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, we are now open for any other motions. Uh, Member Davis, please. I have a question, Chair, mm -hmm. and it may lead to a motion. I would just like to know um, if we have had feedback. When I was at the Charter Symposium on Saturday, I had some folks express real worry about the financial repercussions of, of the safety bill that passed this last legislative session. And um, as they were talking to me after, I mean, a couple of this, the singletons were saying, you know, if, if we get into compliance with this bill, we, we won't exist anymore. Like, we can't afford what they're asking us to do. We won't exist. So I guess, I don't know, we have to figure out, is the point to have safer schools or what is the point of having safer schools if some no longer exist because of the exorbitant costs? And is there a way to mitigate that by either asking for fiscal notes or reducing some of the, um, the requirements? And do we need to have a conversation uh, with the legislature about these real concerns that folks are having. Can anyone, have any of you heard this or is it just me? I am gonna, Chair Moss is gonna address this because uh, it's Chair, an ongoing yes. conversation. Thank you. And I haven't heard from the schools, but I did talk with Representative Wilcox earlier today. And my question for him was, what are you hearing? What is your plan? Do you have something in the works? What are you proposing that we consider? Um, he's hearing the same thing. He's also heard it from districts. There was a um, shortfall in the amount of funding, obviously, to cover it. Now it's expanded to everybody. They're looking for further data on which schools have turned in their grant applications. Apparently, some have started to trickle in. Rhett would know this. They put the date for the final application, apparently, at the end of the year. They're hoping to accelerate that so that we can find out what the needs are. But at this point, um, they're looking long term to include this as something pegged to the WPU, is my understanding, is what the legislature is considering. So my question to him was, we're about to start talking about this, where are you guys? That's where they are. They're looking for more data, and then they're looking for a long-term fix, and they're planning to have some discussions. I think Member Carey's been appointed to a task force. Uh, any of us could be involved. Towards the end of August, my understanding is they'll have more information from some of the discussions they're having both nationally with other folks and also locally in terms of grant applications. And they will have information that we might use to consider our position on additional funding in September. That's what I'm hearing. I see Patty nodding her head. Nothing there sounds inconsistent with what you're hearing. And so I, I think there's digging going on. There's process yeah. underway, but we're still a little bit in the dark as to what's coming at the grassroots level and what the legislature is gonna consider a priority. I think there is a general sense among the folks on the hill that they want to build this in as some kind of baseline. Peg the w. So I'd like to add to that as, Matt's on there. as an 
Oh, you're the one on the task force? Oh, I thought Joe was on, a, okay. on the safety task force. There's two of them, and there's, remember, right. there's different. I forgot. Sorry. Yeah. So we've got Member Hymas and Member Kerry involved in those discussions. The other thing is, as an LEA, gotcha. Sorry. the next deadline is that we all have to have our um, self-assessments done by December 31st. So before that, it's really hard to tell um, where the baseline is for the needs. And so in my view, the biggest, the next step may be simply to adjust dates so that people can take a collective breath because you can't have anything, we really don't, we're stabbing in the dark. Oh, that's bad. Um, we are making guesses until we find out what each district and school needs. So we're looking for answers before answers are even possibly in, you know, in the realm. So I think for me, yes, it's a funding question, but I think that's been universally recognized. To me, um, some reassurance or some right sizing of timelines would be enough for um, some of us to feel better, I think is, is just one perspective. And do you mean adjust the timelines for the grant applications? No, and no, of no, no, no. Because okay. part of the problem. Because they're hoping to accelerate that to get a better idea of what's. Right. But the problem is right. that right. you've got LEAs and schools that see a bill that has a deadline that's already passed and you feel like you're in no man's land because you can't comply with the deadlines of the bill and you feel like you're at risk. So if the deadlines from the bill changes, I think that would lower the temperature for our LEAs and schools as we try to figure out what rises to the top for priority and costs and the realities. Uh, it's just another perspective. Please. So then I guess that question is, if there is a need for some adjusted timelines, is that a motion that okay. we would request the legislature consider in uh, some kind of a special session? Or is this just a, an informal conversation that needs to be had with them as you're having your conversations? And Chair, I, I'm just going to add, and then I won't say anything else about this unless you need me to make a motion. I am asking, have any <laughs> Have any LEAs, charters and districts, asked for this to be attached to the WPU? Because I've never heard that before, but I have heard many LEAs ask for a weighted to the WPU be attached for self-contained, categorized, or, or evaluated special education students. And I'll say I don't know enough to know that. My discussion with Representative Wilcox was that this was being um, this is where I think those focused on safety in the legislature were leaning and that it's being discussed and developed. I don't know where it came from. I know, at least my sense is they're very interested in having LEAs submit their needs assessment grant applications so that they get a better read on what's needed, what's being applied for. I think the more of that that's front loaded, the better in terms of assessing the long-term funding need, and I think they do have an interest in that. I, my response was, you know, uh, just guessing, our body would support this, that, and everything if we can take it from roads and prisons and everything else, right? But we know how this works. <laughs> just roads, oh, okay. I mean, right, it, it becomes a matter of our board expressing a priority at some point. So I don't think they're looking for a special session. I think they're looking to have the discussion, hear from the LEAs, and then have that formulate where they're going and hear from us on where we think they ought to go in the session. That was my takeaway, at least. Patty Norman, am I good? Yeah. You're yeah, good. Okay. Um, Patty Norman, Deputy Superintendent of Student Achievement. I just um, wanted to also reiterate what you said in the very beginning, Chair Moss, uh, about uh, the work of the School Safety Task Force. Um, just as a reminder, what those numbers came down to last year was a shortfall of $37 million of priority one needs, what are considered priority one needs on a rubric. So that's with about 700 of our schools applying. We do have an additional 300 something schools that never applied, and now they have to do that needs assessment. It is a requirement. Requirement. So um, schools that didn't get funded last year, more requirements that are going along with that that are in that were in HB 80, 
84? Angie, I always look, 82, 84. 84. Oh, there we go. Okay, and so um, with that, if you look, it's actually a con it's on um, the next agenda item where it's talking about uh, uh, legislative funding requests, and there's a there's a business case, and there are legislative requests for funding in there that speaks to the needs. And that um, in there, it's 100 million, and there's a formula for how that was um, decided upon. But as Chair Moss was uh, speaking right now, uh, that is that's a beginning point to just with the needs that were mentioned before that hadn't been fulfilled. Uh, of the $37 million, and then fulfilling that with what could be priority one needs with the new legislation. Okay, so I want to, I just want to take a time out for just a minute. Um, we have made the decision to cancel dinner, so we are on the clock. Um, uh, remember that we have moved through the five items that staff have brought to us, so where we're at right now is if we want to propose and vote on any items that you want uh, staff to work up um, for l legislative or for statutory changes. That's what we're doing right now is statutory changes. So let's stick with statutory changes, um, get through those, and we will talk about Legisl draft legislative funding requests in just one moment. Does anyone have, or would you, are you prepared, or would you like to make any motions, anybody, for statutory changes? Jo uh, Member Kerry, I know you've got your hand up. Uh, I did, Deputy Norman, address the same issues oh, I was gonna raise, great. so. Okay. Um, Member Bogus. So I cannot find my notes on this, but I would move that we direct staff to work with a legislature, legislator to amend the code related to testing and that an alternate district test cannot be mandated when a parent opts out of statewide testing. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, second, I'm going to give it to Member Kerry. And would you speak to your motion, please? Yeah, so this is just an ongoing concern that's brought to me. And the concern is that they opt out of the statewide test and their kid is thrust into a district assessment that is mandated and it's presented as required. Um, because they opted out of the RISE testing, they have to take this other test. And I think we need to just be very clear and explicit that if you opt out of statewide testing, LEAs may not in any way, shape, or form require alternate testing in lieu of the RISE assessment. Okay. Does um, any questions I, from other board members or comments? Member Lear. And I'm just trying to understand the motion, Member August. Can I ask her a question? Please? Oh, please. Uh, she um, she's she um, may or may not I, answer. Uh, what if what if their alternative? What if the districts the LEA's alternative is to say you can opt out of that, but you're you will be then required to write a paper as directed by your English teacher or That's some. Yeah. So is. that so that students could go without any evaluation at all. Oh, sorry. Right, I get opt out of state testing. I get that, like mm -hmm. the RISE test. Mm -hmm. So then a, an LEA's option to someone opting out of the RISE test is to say, well, your English teacher will then provide you with a couple of assignments for us to evaluate your progress. That would not be allowed? So as I understand it, they already cannot do That's that. That's not allowed already. They, so this student would go would be completely unevaluated. Um, no. no. Uh, the, may, may I hey. go ahead? So this, there is a process for evaluation. We're talking about um, a computerized, uh, computer adaptive, the assessments that parents do not want their children to take. We're not yeah, talking about a standard assessment applied to all students. But, but I, I, and I get that. I'm not. That's not my question. My question is about. Spell. I mean, to make it really simplistic, the teacher could give the student, say it's a, a third grader and part of the RISE test was spelling, the teacher could give the student a different spelling test. I, I think that that's already done in schools. But we don't know. Well, well I don't know of any educator that does not provide 
a, an end of unit spelling assessment and, for students. And that's what I'm saying. This doesn't reach to what educators would require for their own assessments for students. It, you, you can't use it. In you lieu. can't use it in lieu. That, that's that, already in code. Well, that changed. You cannot. Yeah, to evaluate the student. I'm not no, talking. The in lieu thing is what's throwing me. I, I'm not meaning. I'm just saying there has to be evaluation methods that teachers can use for students. Do we have? Uh, uh, so, it, may I, may Darren I clear Nielsen. your number, Lear? Darren, would you like? Uh, uh, so, to, it, may I talk yeah, to you? Yeah. Member Lear, the, the intent is not to circumvent or prevent a teacher from evaluating their students. It is to prevent the mandating of a secondary assessment when the rise is opted out of. I get that. I totally get that. It, intent either is not what I'm interested in. I don't want teachers I don't want teachers to be discouraged from evaluating students. Um, that, that I don't want the, that to be the net result of this kind of a um, Yeah, I don't emotion. think that would be the net result. I, I, I don't and I, and, and no. I think that intent is sometimes different than what are the teachers are saying what I'm saying. So you mean I can't evaluate? the student or the district can evaluate the student or the hold hold on I, w I have a question for mm -hmm. um, uh, Darren dif uh, yes um, the the I believe that the provision what you would be looking at member Bogus, is a is a specific is specific to standardized testing and the do's and don'ts in the, isn't that a different part of that is a part of rule and law that is separate from, that is just having to do a standardized testing. Yeah, Darren Nielsen, Assistant Superintendent of Student Learning. Um, we do have uh, identified in state code what is included in the parental um, exemption form. And this board has taken that up annually. Typically we bring that and we, we review it. And there's discussions about that. And most recently, the last time the board discussed that, um, there was, I think it was board member Kerry asked questions about um, right of conscience, which is a separate piece of legislation and students can um, exempt themselves from anything that they violates their right of conscience from. But you're right, there is a code that talks about which assessments are included in the parental exclusion form. That doesn't mean that you can't also uh, exclude yourself or your child from right of conscience. I was just looking at the rule um, that the board has, and I think uh, this line is probably the closest to what we're talking about here. The administration of any assessment that is not a statewide assessment, so a district assessment, including consequences associated with taking or failing to take the assessment is governed by policy adopted by each LEA. And so right now the LEA would determine if a student decides, if they offer an alternative assessment to the RISE or whatever statewide assessment is, if the parent or the student decides to exclude themselves from that, the local policy determines what the consequences uh, for that would be. And is it correct, Member Bogus, that you're looking to amend that part? But yes, to amend the part that allows them to mandate a secondary computer adaptive assessment. Only computer adaptive? Well, any assessment that a, a parent would f take issue with, oh. in particular, the the data mining assessments that take place. Um, and I, I just hope happen to cross over to a district that I get a lot of complaints about that. Can I ask you? Oh, oh, can I get No, in line? I think uh, thank you. I there's nobody line. else. You're next in line. Go ahead. Um, I should have had my question formulated better. Um, what are the other types of assessments? I think Member Lear raised a couple. This just goes to clarifying the nature of the amendment. Um, if the alternative assessment is a writing something or other, right, or an assessment that's not computer adaptive, you're just looking to say you cannot use a district um, version of computer adaptive testing because presumably that's the reason for the opt-out. I don't know that the opt-out opportunity is limited to computer adaptive testing, though, is it? Can I clarify that? So, so, so maybe that's the question: Is what what are the current bases for opting out of the state assessment? Uh, 
Um, there is a, there is encode. It identifies what quali qualifies for or constitutes a statewide assessment. And there's a couple of criteria around that. Um, one is paid for by the state, delivered on a state system, and I think there's another element that I can't think of off the top of my mind right now. And that's what governs this board when you create the <coughs> parental exclusion opt-out form. Um, that's what governs what assessments get included on that. To board member Bogus, uh, as I listened to her talk, uh, rather than computer adaptive, it might be that uh, what your concern is computer-based assessments, because um, schools will administer assessments that could be delivered on a computer that's part of a system that they purchase directly with a third party. Um, NWEA might be an example of that. There's a, there's a number of those. Or the district might uh, contract with a party that allows them to build their own assessments and deliver those to students on their own computer um, delivery system. Um, and that would be the pieces, uh, when you mentioned data or concerns with data, and data mining, um, in order for um, any entity to access that, they would need to be delivered on a computer-based system. We also have assessments that are delivered on paper, pencil, or as was talked about here, you know, essay-type uh, formats of, uh, of questions that could be ans asked and then answered by students. Those are reasons for opt-out? Those are types of assessments. Those are types of assessment, but the reasons that, that the legitimate basis for opt out is that enumerated? Oh, computer adaptive. State no, no, mandated? the reason doesn't. We can't. The districts can't even ask what the reason that the parent wants to exclude their child from this the test. Okay. So, we, so there's not a list of can't reasons for and reasons. Yeah, that's that aren't what I was acceptable. getting at. Okay, because no. I think Member Bogus is talking about a particular reason for an opt out from the state assessment, and not allowing the district to impose a mandate to do that same type of thing. Just clarification question from Member Bogus. Would, would you be saying would, that once you've opted out of a state test, the district can have no alternative assessment, or is it a limited form of alternative assessment that you would be seeking to prohibit? Oh, sorry. So the the example that comes to me most often is, and I'm glad you mentioned it, um, Director Nielsen, that um, they, they opt out of RISE assessments, and then here comes the MAPS assessment from NWEA, and it's mandated by the district because you opted out of RISE. So and and that, that's not okay. If parents opt out of testing, they opt out for a reason, whatever that reason might be. But we can't have a required assessment in lieu of an opted out of required assessment. Would and you it be, seems to oh, be an ongoing issue sorry. that people don't seem to get that opt out means I said no and I really meant no and I get I kind of get tired of having to walk parents through this and I, I don't mean that in a in a disrespectful way but our districts should learn that no means no and if we have to go to code to get them to understand that then we need to go to code to get them to understand that would you be open to working with staff and working something up and bringing it to the next board meeting I am happy to do that as long as you're not going to tell me I'm too late. Oh, no. We've got a number of things coming in s September. Uh, that is, there is no, just to confirm, there's no deadline that would be before the end, really the end of the year. For statutory. For statutory. I understand um, there's a difference. I was just going to say, you're right. Statutory changes, we've asked for bills during the session before that mm -hmm. have come up. So, yes, we have all the way until sign a die the last day of session to ask for requests. One thing I will keep, uh, just did want to give as a heads up, last year the Education Interim Committee graciously did um, give us the opportunity to make a presentation in October for a potential committee bill. So um, I would say September and October, if board members are interested, that would be a good time is to bring these up in September, October. If there are potential policy requests that you would like feedback from staff on, feel free to reach out to me or Greg first. And then like we could loop in, for example, on this one, Darren and, I, and you and I, for example, mm -hmm. or you and Darren and Greg could get together and work on some language and kind of brainstorm what that would look like. If, if uh, It's an offer uh, if you would like to us to help you with policy requests for September, October. We're happy to do that. Yeah. My, I'm, I'm my happy to do that okay. as long as we get to the desired end. Yeah. It, and I think the benefit of that is that we m there might be more support when everybody is really clear on... I mean, computer aided, computer, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. there's just too many words in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if, the if that sounds good, we can. That sounds do good. It. I'll reach out to you both, and then, and then we'll find a time to get together. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Member Real. 
And then member Thanks, Davis. Thanks, Vice Chair Hart. My question um, for member Bogus is that if we, since we are putting on a hold, I would, I think we need to be specific about alternate tests saying non-electronic in that m motion or in, in whatever we send up there because for how this reads now, it just says that they require students to take an alternate test when they opt out, but that just means if they opt out for any reason, not if they specify they don't want to take the electronic test. So I just think we need to be really clear about the electronic piece on that okay. moving forward. They don't have to provide a reason they, for uh, Yeah. Right, but. So to provide an alternate in, that would require them to state a reason. You could have a limited. Well, what is an alternate? Is it, I mean. I, let's let them work up okay. so, yeah, that we're, we're so that we're all using the same um, commonly defined words. Um, Member Davis? Yeah, in the, you know, month, I mean, can we figure out where this is happening and to what extent? I mean, I just texted an assessment director in, in my area, but to find out, um, or a curriculum director, rather, you know, if that's required, if, you know, because someone t gets out of the, opts out of the RISE testing, so I'd really like to know what are the common practices when somebody opts out of a RISE test and do they do they have to take a different one because they opted out and what is the data used for is it looking at that kind of longitudinal trends or, or what the situation is all right I we're going to pen that one till not uh, officially we don't need a motion but uh, we look forward to that conversation next month uh, are there any other requests to add and let me remind you that we did cancel dinner, so every minute um, is a minute farther away from your next meal time. And we will move to 12.2, draft legislation funding requests for the 2025 general session. And everybody's leaving. <laughs> uh, uh, staff, which staff is speak? Ah. <laughs> Deputy Jones. Deputy Jones. <laughs> oh, you do have a partner at least. Okay. I'm in line. I'm in line for Oh, you're in line? Okay. Good afternoon, Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Scott Jones. Um, so I'm excited about this agenda item. We're making great progress towards the eventual submission in accordance with the Budgetary Procedures Act. You can see the reason why we do this, which is the Budgetary Procedures Act, um, in addition to making requests to the legislature for uh, new funding. Um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Chief of Staff Young for um, her update on where we're at in the process. Uh, again, great progress has been made, uh, so she can share that with you and we can take it from there at your direction, Madam Chair. So. I'll be Madam Chair. Go, Go ahead, Chief of Staff. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So Chief of Staff, Sarah Young, at the direction of the board, staff have prepared multiple uh, legislative funding request files that you'll see in backup for this item. As a friendly reminder, um, there are two mechanisms by which these could have come forward. One, through recommendations of the Finance Committee that then came before the full board, and with the support of three board members in our last full board meeting in June. So our purpose here today is to present you with those draft files to receive feedback. Um, do the requests meet your intent as board members and or are there things that we can refine and improve upon before we then bring these back in September to be able to request uh, your feedback on whether these items will be board supported ahead of then a prioritization effort in the month of September and October to finalize the board request that will then go to the governor's office. I appreciate that as multiple steps. We have included um, a, a timeline of kind of how that 
uh, shakes out in the backup as well. Um, but the file I would draw your attention to is the one that starts with the name Tracker. So Tracker General Session 2025 is going to have the full list of what was requested and what has been developed in response to uh, the board member requests. So with that, we as your staff are happy to take feedback. Okay, not everybody hit your button at once. They're looking for our feedback. Okay, uh, Vice Chair. Feedback, oh. I just, yeah, I have a, a motion. Okay. Um, I, and I just, I'm looking for support on this too, but this is, uh, this has to do with our critical personnel. It, it kind of has two components. So I'm requesting that the critical personnel needs of USB move forward for board consideration and that the board use, should I move them as two separate? Um, or I'll move it as a full if yeah. someone wants to divide it. Um, and that the board use $100,000 of um, federal mineral lease funds from the board's discretionary account to hire an independent firm to conduct a desk audit of state funded positions at USBE. The independent firm will evaluate positions to determine if the positions are adequate in job duties and responsibilities market both government and private sector, comparative pay and classification. The firm will analyze whether state funded positions are sufficient in quantity and alignment to ensure the ca uh, capability to meet state laws and USBE rules. The SOW RFP slash RFP and selection process include at least two board members. The timeline would be mid-December. So it's two requests there and I just need a second. Okay. The motion's been made um, and, and I seconded. Yeah, I just want to speak to that. We have, we have um, some requests for critical needs. I'm just asking that those be written up so we can, right, be con be considered as possibly putting on there. But even more than that, looking at really an evaluative tool that someone to come in and just say, do we have the staff we need? Are we, you know what I mean? Are we fulfilling what we need to be doing? Where's our, our areas of, um, um, that we need addressed or not, maybe we're, you know. Anyways, and part of the reason for that is during the, um, I, I, I fr hear this frequently that I hear USB is bloated or I mean, I hear that, that we're overstaffed or we're this or that. And if, if we are, then that answers some of those questions. If we're not, it seems like we, we end up with a lot of um, bills that somehow we, we are just supposed to assume the, the um, the personnel. So I, I guess I'm asking for an analysis just to say, hey, where's our, where's our key areas? You know, what do the laws say? Are we missing an, a lot of people or are we not? Are we understaffed? So I'm, I'm asking that we, we take a look at our critical needs, but we also have kind of just an independent look at that too. So that's my request. Did someone get that motion? Okay. Um, do we think that we could? There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, Member Booth? For the past four years, we have talked the talk the critical needs that we have in the agency and um, and we've definitely uh, I mean we can talk to any one of our area heads any of our assistant superintendents just in our interaction with our staff who are working so hard and who do work so hard as we have requests there's no question that this is an intense need and every year it has been kind of bounced down and eventually um, lost in terms of being able to provide the funding and to make it happen. The agency continues to tighten their belt, pull up their bootstraps and, and make it happen. Um, I would be very much in favor of supporting their, I mean, they they have been very specific in in identifying specific needs that they have and where are the 
areas where they're running short, no matter how efficient they try to be. Um, and I would love to receive that feedback and come up uh, with a very clear statement that this is a priority and it's a priority that needs to be uh, addressed rather than just letting it drop and kind of sift its way through to the bottom until it drops out of the running. So, thank you. Member Lear. Um, I very much agree with Member Booth. However, I'd also, I've also experienced desk, desk audits and they're sort of like an, an LEA audit only on an individual level and they're not, they're, they're time consuming, they're not necessarily painless. I'm just wanting to ask Superintendent Dixon if she feels like that juice is worth the squeeze. If, if she's wanting, if, if she would welcome that, hoping to provide in objective information for the legislature and, and she, if she thinks that will be helpful. Is that a okay question to pose well, to the Superintendent? Uh, superintendent, you can try to answer that if you want or, and I don't know is Sure, sure. I mean, it's, it's always a fair question. Um, I, I mean, I think we're pretty aware of our needs when we get when we get mandates from the legislature without additional staff. We then have to prioritize internally. So we're always figuring out what do we prioritize, what can we give up, what can we not give up, and there are things, quite frankly, that we just don't know how to get done. So we've been tracking. I'll, you know, I'll give you. A, an example in UPAC. We know, for example, we have data about how far behind we get because we don't have the personnel we need in UPAC. Um, you know, they're just those kinds of things that we're tracking, which is why we then bring the FTE request to you as a board for your consideration every year. In terms of the, if I got your motion right, ma'am, the HR piece on, um, on comparative pay and classification, DHRM does a fair amount of that uh, now. So we have many of the positions that we can go to to say, for example, when was the last time a market analysis was done on this? Or do you have positions within the agency? What does a specialist look like in our agency? That's not a good example because they're, I don't know that there are specialists in other agencies. But we can ask about a certain title and even have it looked at across the agencies and they have that data. Um, I can't speak for Member Earl for her perspective, but um, we're always happy to have outside perspectives who can do a fair analysis. What is challenging for me, I'm just speaking for myself, are outside purviews who don't know what we're doing internally. And, you know, it's easy to say there are too many employees or they're overloaded or they're not here doing the work and don't understand that when you have the conversations and can show um, how you're tracking the work uh, then there are some ahas and things that they didn't know but I, I appreciate that the perception is out there I too to Vice Chair Earl's point have heard it um, it's something that we we combat every time there is an unfunded mandate and people and I can think of five or six even just this last year where well-meaning, truly well-intended legislators said, well, can't you just absorb this? And they were really big lifts. And, you know, my first question was, well, where does that go? To whom? There's nobody sitting around just saying, I have nothing to do. Could you give me something to do? So um, we go through this every single year when there's something new that we can't do. And I think we're really honest about oh, that is a one-time thing. That might take 10 hours and this person can absorb that. So we, we try to be very judicial in our conversations with legislators about what we can and cannot do. Okay, I just, my quick Did I answer your question, ma'am? Yes, you did. I'm just, in, in response to that, I'm reluctant. It sounds like we've got the information we need. I feel like the stress of a desk audit is one more thing that these folks don't need and I feel like it's kind of a I feel like it's m won't be as helpful I don't I feel like if the legislature isn't listening to the people who are doing the work they're not going to listen to a 
um, an audit firm who really doesn't understand the work anyway. So I guess I, I'm, I'm not, it's $100,000 is not a lot of money in the big picture. I'm just not sure it'll be helpful. Thanks. Cindy's up. Member Davis, uh, uh, Member Real, and then and then Chair, um, Chair. Um, I certainly think you know there's merit to having even more when we go to the legislature every year when we get turned down. But at the same time, we're spending a lot of money now on lots of different studies. We're spending money on, you know, to study this thing, and we're spending money to study that thing, and we're spending money to study another thing. And I, on this particular one, I'm concerned about the double because some of these, uh, I think a lot of th our positions, we already have market pay studies done for us by HR. So I, I'm, I have to ask myself this question. Um, I know that there are students in Orem, Utah, not my area, but I'm going to speak up for them, that just lost 75% of their Title I funding. I ran into a teacher on the walking trail um, this past week. I said, how's it going? I didn't even bring it up, and she was near tears talking about losing their Title I funding. So at some point, do we use our money to help help the kids and the things we're trying to help by studying all the things? <laughs> or do we continue to put money into all of these studies instead of maybe when we see a real need like, you know, the fiscal cliff our medium-sized charters just hit or our big charters just hit or the fiscal cliff that our rural schools just hit or now this fiscal cliff that that um, these Title I schools are suffering. At some point I feel like maybe the money's better spent actually doing than continuing to study. Okay, member real and then chair. Yeah, um, I, thank you, Vice Chair Hart. Vice Chair Earl, I, I, the intention of this I appreciate. At Salt Lake Community College, we recently went through a similar audit where they examined all of the positions at the institution and they determined if a lot of the different pieces that you have in here as well as um, the pay and the pay scale. And one thing that we learned from that is that we needed to find $4 million because we had that many faculty and staff who are underpaid at the institution. So I, I do want to warn that this could potentially come with us, seeing that a lot of our staff could potentially be under market, and we would need to find funds to bring them to market um, in their salaries. So just something to consider as we think about this. And the other question I had was that, um, is there a potential for us to once, like, approve the scope of this audit once we have it or is it just something that like once we approve this then the scope would just go forward or would it be something the audit committee would approve I'm not sure how that process works would you like to I, I think whatever we move forward here it I mean if we go too far out I the intention was to create credibility right an independent look creates credibility to the asks I, I can I mean, I heard it last year. I've heard it for the last couple of years, but we can we can just we can go with what we've got. We we really haven't got the staff that we've requested. This just creates a, a credibility. It looks at those in depth. But if we want to just continue the way we're going, no, we can do that. So I think I think you missed the first part of what I was saying. Is okay. that we did this at Slick, and we had a short. We found that lots of staff were underpaid, so we had to find funds to then pay them, which could be something that we I could see. use as a request to the legislature. I, but I this just, is what I'm moving forward. So whatever I mean, if people wanted to modify it, that that's probably the scope of work that would be looked at. Okay. Right. So if it needed to be altered, probably now is the time to do it. Or if we needed to set it out, or could we bring it, bring back the approve the scope once then, or is that? I I don't know. Maybe someone that does contracts can speak. Or to it that. goes to audit. I don't know. I just if there's an like just. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um, let's run through a few more um, comments, and then we'll get some answers to some questions. Uh, Chair. Quickly, and I won't be the dead horse, but we've been up there each year that we've been in leadership pitching our. FTE needs, pitching our market, oh, sorry, um, pitching the market shortfall and the pay. We've done it publicly at PEA. We've done it behind the scenes with legislators. We hear the same questions. We hear, you got 385 people or whatever it is, can't you adjust somewhere? And 
you know, it, it's a it, it's a question that you answer often in a business setting. And here, the, the difference is, a lot of what we have is mandated <laughs> by law, right? So we don't get to just decide, hey, we're going to chop this and put it over here. But there there is a question of whether we're analyzing. So for me, as one who's been up there doing the pitching, I think this this helps, um, you know, to identify this at least on the front end. What are these positions? What's the market? What does it take to keep these people in finance? Over the four years that I've been in finance, we've had a war on talent, as, as Chair Huntsman used to call it, where we'd lose folks that were working on important issues, moving forward the initial early stages of USIMS. So it, it's it's a real challenge, and I think this would help us to quantify it um, and back it up. I'll just say the flip side is kind of the you know educational ROI that we're doing in finance, where up front is sort of what does the position do, what are the tasks, what's market rate, on the back end we've started to ask the questions of, are we getting the water to the end of the row? And beyond that, is anything growing? <laughs> That's the ultimate outcomes, is what we're doing tied to student success. I think both of those put us in a better position to go up to the legislature and say, look, we're analyzing it, we're, we're looking at the needs, we're asking questions about whether programs you've given us to implement are moving the needle. And so we're part of that discussion that you want to have about does the money make a difference? And if not, we're open to the possibility of adjusting and advising you, the legislature, on what's moving the needle and what's not. And I think that, that put, makes us a partner in that discussion um, as much as kind of a requestor. So I see this as one part of that same discussion that, that puts us in more credibility when we go up and make our pitch. I'm going to weigh in, weigh in here. Um, <clears throat> And then it will be uh, uh, Superintendent Dixon, Davis, Norton, and then Booth. I don't, I mean, to be blunt, we can rank it where we rank it to get more staff. Something like this wouldn't be to prove to us. But if we don't do something different, I don't think we should expect any different than what the legislature has done for the past five years. So if we do the same thing, we should expect the same result. If we, if we want to get some relief for our staff that are, that are wearing so many hats, then we've got to think of a different way to make the case. Um, I don't know what that is, uh, but to not do anything and think that we are going to get something different than we've gotten for the past five years, I think is folly. So. That's just my two cents. De uh, Deputy uh, Superintendent Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to reference two audits, and perhaps what we could do in accordance with the motion is to get some updated numbers from the audits. We had an audit in 2017 that was on re related to admin costs, and at the time, it showed that um, we were well below our neighboring states of Idaho, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado in FTE compared to our student enrollment. So our ratio at that time was about one, who even my cheaters aren't ha helping, uh, one to 2,488 students. And the next closest was um, Arizona at one to two, one, one, eight. Um, and then it goes way down from there. And then there was another audit in um, 2022 that uh, gave a few different numbers. And it, in part, we, we gained more federal funds with the growth of the number of students with disabilities being served. Um, so we could look at the data from 2017 and 2022 and try and update that data. That would give us a ratio that may or may not help. I really appreciate what Chair Moss said in terms of ROI. I think that's always really important when we have discussions. What I'm challenged by, what I'm challenged by in accordance with what Vice Chair Hart just stated, um, she's absolutely right. We keep doing the same thing and getting the same result. I'm challenged by how to do it differently um, when we're not given an opportunity to talk about not just the funding but policy overall how are all of these policies with or without funding making a difference in outcomes for students and i feel like a lot of the things that we are asked to spend our time on when w with or without new fte don't always get us to the end of the row with return on investment so i would love to see some kind of mechanism for feedback 
to the legislature to say, given all of these new bills, here's how it's impacting education or not. I don't know that we have the data and results on that, but I, to me that is a way to enter into the conversation about um, how we need more FTE or not. So I think we keep going at it from, we have more work, we need more FTE, we have unfunded mandates to hear all of the things that you've done to us, with us, for us, and how are all of those things really helping kiddos at the end of the day? So that's what I'm challenged by, how to, how to enter into that conversation in a real meaningful way instead of just a high level theoretical conversation. And Chair Hart wasn't even here to hear all of that. We got it. So I think you got I it. I think I'm taking her, her seat. Cindy, is it, Randy, is it Member Davis? and then I know um, Joe Carey's online. Oh. I, I, yeah, Joe Carey was a, probably in the middle of that. He's Let's do Davis, Norton, Carey, Booth, and Straight. Okay. That's all right. So Member Davis? Do you want to hit Davis? Um, yes. I have two questions, and then maybe a motion. Uh, my questions are, Chair, uh, how much time will it take for staff to complete an audit of this scope? And the second one is, can we prioritize this for our own independent audit department here who at least has some knowledge of what we do here uh, instead of going with an outside firm? And I guess upon those two answers of those two questions, uh, I don't know, I might have a motion. Just a, a slight amendment. If I could turn to anybody involved in audit, I guess well, Mr. Earl, are you stepping I, in for that? Yeah, maybe ask Scott, but I, I would, Say we'd, it would probably take reprioritization of what we've got going on, That's which, fine. Ma which yeah. may be necessary. Fine. So, yeah. So, if I may, um, Deputy Superintendent of Operations Scott Jones, I won't speak for an internal audit. To, uh, if we're looking at the scope of the audit being for every state funded position, we're talking months, maybe even a you know a full year because of all the details that would have to be. Um, drawn out by that I you, you know I would encourage you to consult with the internal audit on that an external firm staff would still be involved with but they likely could do it more quickly uh, meaning like six months because if we're trying to push to get enough information solid data for the legislature or ahead of the legislative session we would have to act now and I don't think uh, with yeah without a reprioritization for internal audit and or Staff, the staff would have time to to meet that to be able to uh, have an informed decision made by the board on whether to support you know additional FTEs. So I'm, we're talking months. Thank you. Does that answer the question, Member Davis? We can move on to Member Norton, unless there was. Yeah, I just want to say I think all the points have been made have been great points. I just figure out the cost versus the benefits and yeah. member Norton oh, there we go oh come on I would agree I think this has been a very thoughtful conversation and and great new insights have been brought up that I appreciate um, and with that being said I I think that you know, the numbers do create evidence, and I think that's important. I think any time we're trying to argue something, you know, it's, it's, we are great people and we do great things, but when you have numbers, that just um, makes it the, the picture a little bit clear. But I, I have a, a lack of knowledge in how things are done in Utah State Government. Is this something that is common? Is this the way other departments justify additional people? What, what is, what is the normal? Deputy Jones. So, you know, I'll, I'll channel Director Watts from DHRM. Desk audits of positions occur quite regularly among the state, other state agencies. However, a scope of every position being audited, I'm not sure they've ever done that. Oftentimes, desk audits will focus on, say, like an IT segment or a finance financial analyst segment or maybe we're unique too in the sense that we have 
the op side that has similar positions with the state, such as financial analysts, IT. So, you know, there, there's some some overlap or with desk audits that have been conducted there. Where it gets a little bit more complicated is in the categories of educational coordinators and specialists, right? Those are LEA type positions, but this is why, to, why I also think it's important that we have a um, external, unbiased, neutral party to advise both you and the legislature so it doesn't appear that staff in itself are auditing their positions themselves to come up with a thing. But to answer, in the, the short answer to Board Member Norton's question, um, Chair, is that they occur quite regularly, but not to this scope. So does that help answer a question over? Or, sir? I see a nod, so thank you. Member Kerry. Hey, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to speak against this because I, I'm just concerned about the timing, and um, you know, if you if you've attended at least one board meeting, you know that I'm not a big fan of the framework. But I understand the purpose, which is, hey, we're going to take all these rules, we're going to see how much staff, how much time we spend on each one of these areas. And when I look at the audit uh, request that's been made, I don't know how we can do a a staff audit without that being married to the framework because those two things are now intertwined and I believe that if we're going to do this audit it has to be more comprehensive to tell us hey you have this as a category two it's understaffed you have this as a category four you're not allocating the necessary resources so without that as a component I'm just going to vote against this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Kerry. Um, Member Booth. Thank you, Chair. I am uh, very interested in just understanding what Superintendent Dixon and her team of of top level administrators. Uh, have already discovered and already studied over the last four years where we haven't received significant input and in, in terms of more resources. What have they identified as the greatest needs? Is there a, is there a prioritization of top seven to 10 positions or needs that could be studied by an outside whoever, uh, and we could be more focused in terms of how we approach this so that we could speak our legislator's language in those very specific needs and then perhaps get those seven to 10 positions rather than, okay, we're gonna study the entire agency and we know that we need this and this and this. We need four million dollars to bring uh, our our salaries up to snuff. Well, you know, I don't think we can solve the entire world right now but there may be some critical needs that we could focus in on and if we focus in on and then find out the information so that we can speak their language we may be able to affect a different uh, outcome than we've experienced the last three years and I'd be all for that interesting uh, question or comment member booth I l let me just ask for purposes of clarification I think in the backup business cases that have been pre presented in terms of critical needs already identified we have an audit case I thought internal audit critical function capacity mm -hmm. is anybody aware of others that go to specific I think at least if I'm understanding correctly member booths asking if we have a focus on particulars that we've identified as the most critical and whether we might focus a desk audit of some sort on those first am I misstating or am I uh, so I'm curious if staff have already just to further his question other than what I saw in the backup for audit yeah chief of staff young yeah no thank you for that 
question and clarification. So uh, when staff was here in June, we presented a table that included just different um, kind of needs from the field as identified by staff. One of those was specific to audit and personnel related to that, which was then um, championed by three board members. So we have developed that into a funding case. Um, when it came to the request for critical FTEs, that was in the table, but that was not, um, staff didn't receive direction to develop that into a further business case. So to, to provide kind of the why, we do have a full workup for the audit component because it was requested by a board member. We currently do not for USBE critical FTE outside of that scope. It just wasn't selected to be further developed at the time. I mean, this is a two-part motion. Is that okay if I speak? Yeah. It's a two-part motion. If someone wanted to divide it, they could. The one would be moving the critical needs forward for a further evaluation. The second would be asking for um, some kind of a audit or you know something from our discretionary funds in order to look at what the you know a further analysis to say yes, this is this is where we need to go and this is where the staff need to be. So it's two parts. It could be divided if someone wanted to or not. So. Okay, so I did he? Um, I'm picking back up. Uh, 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 board member Strait, board member Davis, and then superintendent. Uh, board member Strait, and then Davis. So it appears we have a whole separate way of going about how we meet the needs of USBE and how we meet the needs of education in general. It appears to me that we have some catch up to, we need to close the gap on where we're at now and where we should be, and then we need to somehow tie ourselves into that same, that same system because right now the WPU, uh, they have the inflationary adjustment plus, and uh, the inflationary adjustment is, is based on a formula of five years. We adjust that, then, then they work through with the legislature, uh, you know, JLC, us, for additional WPU to meet the needs. Things like we need some type of automatic mechanism because we're getting caught up in ending up getting further and further behind. I, Anyway, I, I think we need to solve that. Okay. Member Davis? Yeah. Uh, Chair, would it be possible to call uh, Auditor Director, not sure the, your official title, Kevin John? Uh, I, I just, uh, we are already doing some things in audit that I think um, lend itself to this. Can we figure out what we're doing, if that would be enough, if there's something that needs to be done? Can we just hear from him for a minute? Sure. Thank you. Um, if if uh, if uh, yeah, you uh, welcome. Come on, come on up. Um, uh, I let's let's manage expectations for a minute. Um, we need to make sure that we keep moving on things, and if it requires um, some time to develop, then I, our best strategy is to is whoever's interested in that to develop that offline and bring it forward because we could probably spend all day. In fact, um, one of the items on the study session list is an update on audits that have been done and are being done and, and how that process works. So that is in our, in our near future. Um, we're kind of coming at you cold, so please feel free to say I'm not prepared to answer that question. Uh, but uh, do you have specific, a specific, can you kind of give them a, a question? Oh, you don't have a hot mic. Okay, there you go. I did just go back and ask him the same question I just asked of you. And, okay. and within understanding some things are confidential that are they're working on, but, yep. but we can at least know kind of the scope and yep. is some of it gonna help us without maybe doing a whole nother audit. So he's not totally cold. He's been asked before. All right, go ahead, introduce yourself and then. 
Uh, it's fair to say that no one in this room is cold at this point <laughs> with the ACL. <laughs> Touche. But Deputy Audit Executive Kevin John. So to Member Davis's point, uh, you prioritized an audit on uh, personnel management approximately a year ago. That is in the process of being wrapped up. So we anticipate taking those final results inclusive of a management response. Your superintendency's had a chance to look at it before the audit committee on August 8th, at which point we would anticipate it could come before the full board in September. One of the areas within that audit that we looked at is overtime and effort that's being put in. Now, again, as Member David said, it's confidential. We can't release the results at this point, but it may answer some of your questions as, as to whether or not um, there's available information out there you could take to the legislature that would support the need for additional resources. So in summarizing, there's an audit that's just about completed, and we might be able to turbo it to have it in time to further develop um, this idea, um, perhaps even by the next meeting, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Good information. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, Deputy CAE. Um, Member Booth. I'm wondering if I could make an amendment. Uh, you, uh, an amendment's in order. Okay, so I, I agree that we, we need more information and what Member Earl has put forward is important. I think maybe we can in some way, uh, I, I don't want to take all of that away because we've got to be able to speak as uh, Chair Moss said, the language of those yeah. that we're approaching. We've got to be able to provide them with the information to be able to make intelligent choices and informed choices. But I think a great place to start would be, as I identified earlier, the critical needs that staff has already identified over the past three or four years where we have not had success. And I would love to uh, propose or move that uh, we direct staff to conduct a thorough and quick study of what they have already identified as critical needs over the past three or four years. This is not something that is a new subject. They're dealing with it every day and they're trying to find ways to, to make it happen <laughs> every day. And so I think it could be a very clear uh, source of information that would help us move this forward in a, a very efficient way, maybe by next meeting. So I would move that uh, they come up with their best guess and best information as to what their critical needs are and what, we would pri what they would prioritize in order to move the work of the agency forward in the most efficient manner. Can I, um, so in clarifying your, your motion, are you looking to have them build out the business case with specific areas or are you having, are you interested in prior to a, uh, um, a request for funding being created, you would like to see a uh, perhaps itemized list of what the agency feels like are specific needs. I trust our team at the agency and if they feel prepared to apply the information that they've already pulled together over the last several years to a business case, I would say go for it. Okay, so would that be a, that would be a, that would be accepting the first part and amending the second part. Would that be accurate? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm not trying to, you know, s take I away just, the importance of what I just need a clarification because, and maybe staff can clarify this. When we ask for something to come before us and we're saying it's critical needs, are they not putting forth, that they're going to be looking at, the, they're going to be doing this to present to us. They're going to be creating an argument to present to us. I don't see where that's different than the first ask. Okay. So, am I missing something? Um, 
you're asking him to find the critical needs, look at them, and then find the critical needs. I, I, he, what I believe what you're looking for is basically saying the first part is internal instead of external. So you're asking for an external person to come no, and validate internal. the internal? You, you asked for um, an independent firm to conduct a desk audit, and what it sounds like is he's asking for staff to do it internally without. Yes, but wouldn't they do that already when we ask for critical needs? They're going to look at critical needs and provide us, staff are providing us with that information. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't change what they would be providing already. So the difference is someone validating the critical needs. So, so. what we need to do is, um, uh, uh, Member Booth has, um, is putting for an amendment we need to take that amendment through the process and do our voting. Um, I'm, I'm just um, clarifying the amendment, um, but why does, um, Member Booth, why don't you um, talk right now to uh, Member Davis because I think she's got an idea. Member Davis? I have a substitute motion. Okay. Can we postpone this until tomorrow when we're already looking at the prioritized audits and just sleep on everything we've heard today and then decide, you know, in light of also what we're already working on in audits and in light of the data that Superintendent Dixon mentioned, okay. can we okay. kind of narrow down to what we still need to know or understand and, and what if that could be tagged on as a supplemental audit? with our folks if we prioritize it or or if we need to go with a biggie like this. I guess I'm speaking to it and I should have done that. I move that we postpone until tomorrow somewhere right near so, or with the audit conversation agenda item. So tomorrow, tomorrow's conversation in tomorrow's um, study session is data privacy and um, strategic plan. During those, uh, with someone mentioned that we were talking about uh, prioritizing. That's on the that's on the, uh, uh, that's on the study session list. It has not yet been scheduled. Let's put it. Can we prioritize? Or can we postpone this then until the section where it's for unfinished business? Okay. On the agenda. Do, did we put From unfinished today? business on tomorrow's agenda? Yes, we did. Okay. So the motion on the floor. I don't know who's driving, is to postpone until unfinished business tomorrow. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Member Booth. Um, as soon as that's ready, we're going to vote on it because I see no other comments. Point of order, when you said sleep on it, are you suggesting we're going to finish in time to go to sleep tonight? Um, yes, I am. Not just, only just, is she just suggesting. Checking. I thought that's what I heard. Come heck or high water. Um, as soon as that's ready, we will vote. All right, please vote. Uh, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One more vote, please, unless somebody's left. Uh, okay, that passes unanimously. All right, are there any others that need to come forth right now? We do need to move on to our next item. Thank you. We will move on to our next item. Member Strait. Yes, if you are the next, if you're bringing something forward, now would be the time. Go ahead. This is for the funding, right? This list? Yes. Okay. So at the very bottom there, we have educator incentives, national board certified teachers. And uh, we do have a second draft. I'm not certain that's completely updated. But chair? Yes, I'm sorry. Would, would it be appropriate and okay if I, I brought uh, some people forward to um, do discuss. If, if anybody has, uh, if board members have questions of, of um, we, we have current certified, national board certified teachers. First of all, let's recognize them. Will you please stand if you're nationally board certified? 
Yay! Thank you for being with us today. Um, where are we at with this item? Um, Chief of Staff Young? So we have Julie Lundell who's taking yes, this from staff. And, and Julie is here as well. Um, where are we at with this particular item? What is the status? Thank you. So um, in working with our experts at the agency, as well as board members straight, um, we have taken the educator incentive request and we've split it into two separate components. You can see those represented um, up on the tracker. And um, that, that was to be able to clarify what the specific needs were in addressing the field. And you'll see that represented in the draft backups that are available available to the board for this item as well. So this one's developed out and is ready for our prioritization? Correct. It's already been brought forward? Correct. Unless there were any additional edits that okay. the board members would like to request, it will move forward with the other drafts to the September meeting for consideration of board support okay. and then subsequently prioritization. I would like to, first of all, um, I appreciate uh, people in the um, in the audience as well as online. We have received quite a number of, of commentary on this and support for this, and uh, um, justifiably so. Are you interested in making any changes to the case study, or uh, to the case, to the? So there's draft one, which is in our packet, and mm -hmm. there's also draft two. Mm -hmm. uh, does this represent two draft two, Julie? No, I, uh, sorry. So, Chair? Yes. This does represent draft two, the numbers that are there. That is updated. Okay. There were some other additions in, in draft two. If you uh, look at that specifically, uh, there, there have been some changes. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, the educator supplemental, uh, oh, no, I'm on the wrong line. The educator incentives, learning for student success, that's early grade, that's K through three. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is gone. And yeah. so that's looking at bringing that element back to meet the goals of USBE and our strategic okay. plan. So it appears that we do not need to make any changes to what we have before us. Um, at this point, we would wait until we, our next step is prioritization. And that isn't until, remind me, September, October? October. So what we would need is um, any changes that we would need to this brought forward before that time. Other than that, we are good to go with this. Okay, and I was wondering if, if the board, if the members of the board, if they have questions or if they have suggestions uh, regarding this, now would be a perfect time to yes, to and that. that um, this has already been moved. This is already on the list. So we don't has need to a question. Do that. We have a majority vote to put it on the list. Yes. Okay. So this. This is already on the list, I'm right? I'm sorry if I missed that, Member Strait. We already had a vote of the board to. <laughs> I apologize. We had a vote of the board to support it, not just yes. the three necessary to work up the business case, but voted majority support to put it on the list. And now the question is whether it's ranked and et cetera. Yes. But okay. Changes oh, were made. Minute. There was a draft two. Oh, changes were made. Go ahead. I'm asking Kelsey. I guess did you have? Okay. Uh, Chief of Staff Chief Young. Staff, yeah, sorry. Where are we at? Sorry, sorry to be confusing. Um, we have multiple steps. So where we are is we are presenting you with the drafts that were requested by three board members. Uh huh. In September, you will have a chance to vote support or non-support for each of those cases. So that has right. not occurred just yet. Uh, right. um, in October, then, you will prioritize those that are supported to be able to then reflect the governor's office per the Budgetary Act what your priorities are in the month of October. Got it. Okay. Three steps. Bring it forward, support it, rank it. Rank it. 
Yes. We've done we've done bring it forward. We have and, yet to and, support or rank. I, and, I, I'm with you. And draft two has been vetted by the National Board teachers. The the teachers have seen this. Yes, we met together. Okay. Excellent. That's up. what we want to see. All right. So we are ready to go in that. I don't think we need further action at this point. Thank you for yeah. allowing Unless me Unless I do actually see a light. Uh, Member Highness, yeah. did you have a question? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't want to be that guy, but here, here I go. Okay. So we're, we're, we're raising um, 5000 for an annual salary. From what I understand, uh, or four thousand for an annual salary if, if they are certified, and then five thousand at a Title One school. Um, this is this more than you would get if I, I just that's a, that's a lot of money for a school to pick up. So I I mean I, I guess there's no question there other than like where's this money coming from? Does this and then does this um, certification does it outweigh it's, it's like uh, I should know this but a master's program or a doctorate like does that does that bring in this kind of increase or is it Brent Chair, I'm looking at you yes Sorry. I, I could answer that question but I believe they can answer the question better so if I could have uh, Tony or well I'm not Emily, sure we we are, have uh, I'm not sure we're we're at that well, we have a question. Yeah. I would like to give my time to. Okay, but it needs to be extremely, we don't, we, this is out of the ordinary. Yes, extremely brief. Okay. Which I believe, to, I think it's Tony. Is the it Tony? It's going to ring in two minutes. Yes. <laughs> oh, we can get it more than that. Um, yes, so can I? Take a shot at uh, yeah. the question. Sure. The money would need to come from the legislature. I mean, that's there you go. I mean, that that's all there is to it. The amounts to it, but this, if you, the board, in September, say you know this this is ours, and then you prioritize it, then by way of the process, if the legislature supports it as well, they would fund it accordingly. So so that's where the money would come from in these amounts, based on our justification for providing those. So. Tony, go ahead and introduce yourself, and and if you have anything to add, please add. I just shut you. I just hit the wrong button. It's me. Uh, I'm Tony Zani. I'm the president of the Utah National Board Coalition. Uh, we've had really good support in the legislature. Um, I think they've been wanting a way to have a teacher pipeline that takes you from being a pre-service teacher to a novice teacher to a career teacher to a master teacher that mentors other teachers, that's what national board certification is. I would say in my experience that a master's degree makes you more knowledgeable, but this focuses on your practice in the classroom. It makes you top-notch master teacher. So my master's degree made me very knowledgeable, but it wasn't really about what I do day to day in the classroom, this is. And national board certified teachers almost never leave the classroom because they're so successful at what they do, so your teacher retention dramatically drops, and they become really good mentors because they're really well trained. Yep. That's a great answer, and well within the time frame. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Are there any other questions we have for national board, the national board issue? Okay, we will have an opportunity. The next step for this one would be an opportunity to uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, and then to put it in priority order. Thank you. Chair, All right. Uh, I, if yes. I could just briefly comment. Yes. The program is already in place. It's right. already operating successful. It has grown exponentially recently. Uh, they've been out working hard and representing that, and they have a Oh, well, oh, almost 250 around that uh, new individuals for this coming fall. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's a good number. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, number yeah, I just, I just want to clarify. I, I don't have a concern with the program. We're always looking at funding. It's just money has to come from somewhere. And so that's, that's the, what I'm looking at here. I, I have no, no 
qualms with the, the program itself and the, the good that it brings in. And I'd love to pay every teacher as much as we can, right? Especially if they are dedicated to the field and doing great work, I, I just love to do it. But again, it has to come from somewhere and that's not directed, I'm just shouting that out to the you know, Ether. Cosmos and yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I appreciate the program, I appreciate what it does, I appreciate those who, who go through it and that it does produce results. But again, the money has to come from somewhere. So thank you. Thank you.